we talked about man and the plan of redemption. Remember? Where man was dead in trespasses and sins. Why was man dead in trespasses and sins? Because he sinned. Because Adam sinned and plunged this world into the curse. And there was also a, 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 a fall in heaven. And God, the, the plan of redemption in the Bible is, a plan, is God's plan not just to redeem man, but also to redeem and to reclaim his universe. The original purpose in creation, Genesis chapter number 1 and verse 1, I think we can quote the verse. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It doesn't say he created the universe. It says he, crea he created two spheres because he had a purpose for both of those places. There's a, a wonderful verse in the book of Revelation. Uh, Revelation chapter number 4, there's that, that scene in the throne room where the, the, the elders are around the throne and the four and twenty elders fall down. And that, that, that great doxology, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and they were created. Why did God create the, the heaven and the earth? He created them for himself. For his own pleasure, for his own glory, for his own honor. And yet what happened? Both of those places were corrupted, weren't they? And so as we think about the original, as we back up and we think about the original purpose in creation, and they're created for the Lord, we know that something happened. We have Lucifer, his original boast and plan, because he had a plan. He wasn't just puffing himself. He had something that he wanted to accomplish, which led to the fall. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 13 and 14, is really a, a prophecy about his doom. He's actually being taunted by those who watch him come down into hell. But it says, Thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the, cloud, the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. See that phrase there? We've highlighted my throne. Satan had a seat of authority. He had a position of rank in the heavenly places up there. He was lifted up with pride, and he wanted to be like the Most High. He wanted to be the one to which worship was directed. He wanted to be ruler over all. And his original boast and plan brought, a corrupt, brought corruption in the heaven. The angel at creation fell. He came down to the earth, got in, went to the garden with Adam and Eve, and the rest is history, as they say. God's purpose was for a kingdom and then later for the nation of Israel. And it was spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets. How long? Since the world began. Even since before Abraham. Noah was a prophet. And Enoch was a prophet and so on. Even before Abraham. And it says, says in Matthew chapter 25, verse 34, we looked at this verse earlier, that uh, at the second coming, the Lord Jesus Christ says, Come and inherit the kingdom prepared from how long? So that goes back before Abraham, doesn't it? The issue from day one has been authority on this planet and the seat of authority. Adam was commissioned to be a king, go out and, 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 and uh, subdue the earth and have dominion over it. Well, Adam, doesn't, he doesn't have dominion over it. Who's, who's the, the, the prince of this world today? The adversary. He's the god of this world. So the issue has been a kingdom spoken from the foundation of the world, prepared from the foundation. Yet the apostle Paul repeatedly asserts the focus of his message and ministry was a mystery kept secret since the world began. We've looked at that verse a number of times, Romans chapter 16 and verse 25. We've got it there. Why was the mystery a mystery? Well, God had a purpose. And uh, the, the book of Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 11, I have the passage here um, where the Apostle Paul speaks about the mystery repeatedly. He says, and I'm going to give you just the, the points there. You can, you can read them for yourself as well. How that by revelation, verse 3, he made known unto me the mystery, whereby when you read, he may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, 
which in other ages was not made known of the sons of men as it's now revealed. Verse 8, that I should preach among the Gentiles the, what? Unsearchable riches of Christ. And to, make all men, and, 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 and to make all men see, verse 9, what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid, where? Yeah, not in the types and shadows in the Old Testament, but hidden where? In God himself. And it's very important to keep this information separate. There's another passage, Colossians chapter 1, verse 25 to 27. It talks about his ministry out among the Gentiles, Preach the gospel to every creature, whereof I am made a minister, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. The word means to fill it up, to fill it full, kind of like, kind of like a chuck hole. <laughs> you know, it, the word literally means to fill up a hollow spot, to fill up a void that was there. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generation, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery, where? Among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. God wants his saints to know how rich and wealthy they are in Christ. There's something about this message, this message that was committed to the Apostle Paul that reveals some things in God's word. It, it opens up many things, but some things in particular. Um, there's a passage in 1 Corinthians, chapter number 2, verses 7 and 8, that tells us why God kept it hidden. 1 uh, Corinthians, chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, he says, in, right there in the middle of page 39, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. There's some hidden wisdom, but there's also some hidden glory associated with that, that you and I are to be a part of. And he says in verse number 8, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have done what? Crucified the Lord of glory. There's something wonderful. When God was keeping this, this message hidden in himself, he was, he was not revealing it to man. In other ages, it was not made known unto the sons of men. But you know who else he was hiding it from? That guy that was puffed up with pride that said he was all hot stuff. It said his heart was lifted up with pride because of his wisdom and beauty. And God was keeping it hidden from the devil as well. There's some hidden wisdom of God some wisdom that was unrevealed that is made known in this message, in his ministry, and there's some hidden glory, he says, before ordained for the body of Christ. There's some unre unrevealed, some hidden glory. God has something that he's going to do for us and going to do for himself and that showed his wisdom. Had he revealed it, Satan would not have crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. The body of Christ was a new people, there was a new purpose, and we saw last time, where is our heavenly home going to be? In the heavenly places. Who's occupying those positions right now? Yeah, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against who? Principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in. And that ain't Washington. <laughs> That's higher than Washington, D.C. You know, there's a, gov there's a governmental structure up there that Satan now holds. And as we work through the scripture, there at the bottom of page number 39, in Matthew chapter number 4, you know that the devil, when he tempted the Lord Jesus Christ, he offered him the earth, didn't he? Matthew chapter eight, uh, 4, verses 8 and 9, and again, the devil taketh him up unto an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if you'll do what? If you'll fall down and worship him. You know, the Lord doesn't dispute with Satan, says, Those aren't yours, those are mine. You know, you know I mean, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I mean, he's the, he's the creator of heaven and earth. But who has dominion and exercises authority in those positions right now? Satan does. And he offered them to the Lord in an attempt 
to disqualify Jesus Christ as the rightful heir. He knew who Jesus Christ was. If you be the Son of God, do this and do that and so on. He just had the baptism. You know, the Spirit had descended from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom thou, now, thou art well pleased. Satan knew the Old Testament, didn't he? He knew the purpose that God was going to uh, set the nation of Israel up on the earth and that, that Jesus Christ was going to be the rightful king. So if I can disqualify the rightful king, then guess who's the only one that can, can step in and take control of it? And he attempted to do that. Of course, uh, he, didn't, he, was, he was unsuccessful, did he? The devil failed. So with the inability to disqualify him, he continued to oppose his ministry and his message. But the only option now was, well, if I put him to death, then I'll be rid of him, and, you know, he'll be out of the picture. So it'll be, you know, it'll be mine for the taking as well. What a surprise. <laughs> what a surprise when, when the Lord Jesus rose from the dead as the, uh, you know, as, as the author of eternal life. There's some fascinating things here, and I'm sure the adversary was surprised. Now, the cross, didn't Satan know that Jesus Christ was going to die on the cross for the sins of the world? Didn't he understand that he was, he was going to shed the blood of the new covenant and all those other things? I don't think he did. You know, we, we talk about, and we made a big point as we came through the four Gospels, did the 12 apostles understand his death, his burial, and his resurrection? Did not, did they? You know, the Old Testament, the, the writers there, we have a passage quoted. Um, let's move over to page number 40. The cross is veiled in language in the Old Testament that even the prophets didn't understand. Um, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 8, we have there um, 8 to 13, but we've, we've selected verses 10 and 11. Talk about the prophetic salvation that was revealed in the Old Testament. Of which salvation? Verse 10, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, the grace that was to come unto the nation of Israel. There's prophesied grace in the Bible. And as they, as they wrote, look at verse 11. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. You know what that says? The Old Testament prophets, as they're writing some of those passages about his death and, and his crucifixion, what is this? I don't, I don't fully grasp what this is. You know, they, they obviously saw Isaiah 53, and they saw the suffering of somebody. They didn't necessarily think it was going to be the Messiah. They saw, obviously, the coming of the Messiah and his birth and all those, all those prophecies. They saw the second coming. They saw those different things, but they, didn't, they couldn't connect the suffering one with the Messiah. They didn't fully see it and grasp it. The 12 apostles... Did they fully understand and grasp? We pointed that out. Peter says, this shall not be unto thee. Yet they knew the Lord Jesus Christ was the king and the Messiah, didn't they? They were looking for him to come. But they did not understand the cross, and they didn't even know about the body of Christ at that point in time. It wasn't revealed as yet. The issue was Israel's program. The question is, why is, is that so important? The message of the Apostle Paul opens up the cross and the truth of the body of Christ because God also had a purpose, not just for the earth. He had a purpose for the earth that he's been talking about since day one, didn't he? A kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world, spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets which have been since the world began. One of the things as we, as we read through the Old Testament, do we see things anything discussed about the heavens? Once in a while we'll see it an appearance of some angels and, you know, Elijah gets, was it Elijah? Elisha. Elijah got caught up. Yeah. You know, and Enoch. But we see very little disgust about the heavenly places. Paul opens up a purpose and a, a people that will inhabit the heavenly places as well. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 7 there on page number 40. He says, You've been, you've been saved by grace and hath raised us up together and made us sit together, where? In heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? That in the ages to come he might show 
the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness in Christ Jesus. Was God a, a God of grace and love? Sure he was. But you know that, that, that hollow spot in God's word? We, didn't, we, saw the, we saw the power of God. And we saw the creative genius of God. And we see the redemption of the children of Israel. We see all those. But you know what God has yet to fully manifest? The exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness and his love. He's going he's to take love to new heights and to new boundaries and to new, dare I say, extremes. Because he's going he's to take the aliens and the strangers and the dogs. It's not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to who? The dogs, the Gentiles. And he's going to take those people <coughs> who had no covenants and no promises. They were sons of Adam. They were enemies. They were without strength. And they were sinners. And he's going to save them. And he's going to put them in the heavenly places as an example of his goodness and his love and the exceeding riches of his grace. Wow, that's really something, you know? And you know who that is? That's you and me. <laughs> we get to participate in that in the ages to come. Why the Apostle Paul? Ephesians chapter number 3, verses 8 through 11. We looked at some things about the mystery earlier in the chapter. He says, unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the what? The unsearchable riches of Christ. I think it's in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, where the Lord in his earthly ministry, he's trying to, he's presenting himself, he's the Son of God, and uh, people were, were saying, hey, we love Moses, and we love Abraham, and the Lord Jesus says, hey, search the scriptures, for those are they which testify of me. You know, there's some, there's some searchable riches of Jesus Christ. There's some prophesied grace that he, that he predicted would come to this earth as he took undeserving Israel, a stiff-necked and rebellious people with a, with a history, and ultimately, put, you know, on the basis of covenants and promises, not on the basis of their performance because they failed under the law, and take that nation and fulfill his promises and put them in the land and, and exalt them and send blessing to the whole world through them. That's some, that's some wonderful grace. But Paul says that, that there was committed unto me this grace, this message, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And verse 9, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the gospel of the kingdom. No. The fellowship of the gospel of the circumcision. No, the fellowship of the what? Mystery. This particular message, in its clarity, reveals some things that people share together. We're members of his body and of his flesh and of his bone. We're all one in Christ. That's an amazing thing. The, the, the life of the body of Christ and the living organism that we are. But you know, he also said back in verse 6 of this third chapter, that we're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. You know what a joint heir is? You know, if you have a joint checking account with your, with your spouse, it means you all, both of you have equal access to all the many thousands and thousands of dollars that's in the checking account, right? <laughs> to be joint is to have joint access to it. The Bible says we're joint heirs with God's beloved son. It's not, we don't just share in a part of what he is going to reclaim for himself. We are going to participate equally with him. That's an amazing thing. He says, we're children of God, and if heirs, he says in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 17, joint heirs with Christ. Here, in the book of Ephesians, the language is fellow heirs with Christ Jesus, not joint heirs with Israel, like the New International Version says. The New International Version gets it wrong because they put us back into Israel's program. We're, we not, we're not heirs together with Israel. We're heirs together with Jesus Christ in a new purpose, and a new plan. And he says, This fellowship of the mystery make all men see, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid, where? In God, who created all things by 
Jesus Christ. Then there's something else there in verse 10. Notice, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers, where? In heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. This is not something that we know. It's something that we know, but as we function, as we make this message known, we're communicating some information to the heavenly beings up there as well. We are reminding them of some hidden wisdom ordained before the world unto our glory. Some wisdom that if God had, had revealed it, the cross would have never occurred. Satan would have had to come up with plan B. You know, God is, it's a, it's a stroke of genius that he just had a purpose in himself that he chose to play his cards close to the vest. And in doing so, he took, he took the wise in their own craftiness. He, the, the deceiver, the liar, the cheat of the adversary, the Lord put the things out there and he, and, and he baited Satan and Satan took the bait and Satan brought about the very thing that brought his downfall and his, do and his doom. God, through the Apostle Paul, makes known the hidden wisdom of God ordained before the world unto our glory and to mankind and to the angelic creation as well. And it's, it was a mystery all along. Right there at the bottom of page number 40, the Apostle Paul says, Who has saved us, and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus, when? Before the world began. Hey, he had this, this, this you know, the age of grace here is not plan B. <laughs> the, the, you know, the prophetic program, Israel saying no, and the, the world's rejected my son. And, I, let's see, I think I'm going to try something else. <laughs> No, God had this stroke of genius and this plan in mind as part of the eternal purpose. He just didn't make it known. And in doing so, he demonstrated his wisdom. He says, because I know that guy. I made him. <laughs> he'll take the bait and he'll deceive and uh, cause his own downfall and doom. He saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Verse 10, bottom of page 40. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Not, the, not his appearing on the earth, but you know, the Lord Jesus Christ appeared again from heaven. Who did he appear to? Saul of Tarsus began to give him some information. This purpose is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Don't stop the verse after verse 10. There's not a period there, is there? You know, the punctuation in your Bible is important too. <laughs> it says real clearly there, that this hidden purpose was made known to who? The Apostle Paul as a teacher among the Gentiles. It was a mystery that God had it planned all along. What a shock. We'll go to page 41. What a shock. If he was surprised when the Lord Jesus rose from the dead. See, one of the things, the, the resurrection is predicted back in the Old Testament, but only in a couple of places. It, it, you know, the, the disciples didn't even realize it when he announced it ahead of time. I, I, I almost think that, that God veiling the cross back there was by design. I don't think. I, I know it was. We can look back, and they always say hindsight is what? <laughs> we can look back in the types and the shadows of the offerings and the tabernacle and the Sabbath day and, and uh, you know, the, the, the scriptures in Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 and all those passages, and we see... God had the cross in mind all along. <laughs> but he hid it. He veiled it for a specific purpose. What another shock it must have been for the devil when the time had come for the wrath to come and it's time to roll up your sleeves and get it on. Let's get ready to rumble. <laughs> he was ready. His time was only short. 
And instead of the pouring out of God's wrath and his judgment, the book of Ephesians says Jesus Christ ascended up far above all heavens and revealed this new program to the Apostle Paul. And Satan goes, what? What? And, and as that began to be manifested, Satan began to learn that his doom was sealed not just on the earth, but God had a purpose and had a people that was going to replace him and supplant, supplant him in the heavenly domain as well. Colossians chapter number 2, there at the top of page 41. It says, He conquered sin and death, but also a victor over Satan in this world. Colossians 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, doing what? Nailing it to his cross. You know where the law is today as far as God is concerned? Still hanging on that cross. You know, mankind, I think he ought to put it in the courtrooms and whatnot. But the law, the law program doesn't belong. The law is not made for a righteous man. It's made for who? <laughs> All the lawbreakers. So the law is nailed to his cross, but look at verse 15. And having spoiled, who? Principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. In what? In his cross. When, when the, the full magnitude of the cross was proclaimed, that we have redemption through the blood of his cross. We have reconciliation through the blood of his cross. We have peace through the blood of his cross. We have propitiation. We have justification. But not only all of that, God is going to save a group of people, make them joint heirs with himself, and give them an inheritance by the cross. That's how, but it wasn't revealed at the cross. When was all this information disclosed? Did we see it in the four gospels? No. Did we see it in the early chapters of the book of Acts? No. We see it in the epistles of Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles. Verse 15, he spoiled principalities and powers. To the victor belongs the what? The spoils, the spoils of war. He's going to take back those positions of rank and authority for himself. And he's going to populate those positions of rank and authority in the heavens and the earth through redeemed humanity. Who do you think gonna, he's going to use to reclaim and, and rule on the earth? The nation of Israel. They're going to be a kingdom of priests. And he's going to rule. He's going to sit on the throne of, of David, and the 12 apostles will sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. But what about those heavens up there? Well, there's a, there's a passage in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16 through 20 that um, you have to really ponder and think about. But I'm going to try to go through it with you in just a few moments that we have here. Colossians chapter 1, verses 13, 14, and 15 talks about the supremacy of the, the Lord Jesus Christ, the firstborn of every creature, and, and uh, in him does all fullness dwell, and so on. And then verse 16, right there in the, toward the, the, the top of page 41, Colossians 1, 16, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. Kind of sounds like the verse we read in Revelation, wasn't it? All things were created for thy pleasure. But look at what the rest of the verse says. And I've kind of broken it up there, here to, to illustrate what he's really saying here. He's not talking about the, the rocks and the trees and the oceans and the earth and the, you know, the, the animals. For, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, whether they be... What? Visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Notice the two realms there. The visible, those are things you can see, and invisible, things you can't see. He says these things are in earth and they're in heaven. But what kind of things are they? They're thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. There is a governmental structure on the earth, is there not? Ruled and reigned, God established human government. There is also a governmental structure in the heavens. Paul uses those same terms to describe both the powers that be here on this earth, but also the unseen world. There is a governmental structure in the heavens right now 
that is populated. There are principalities and powers, and they're not flesh and blood, but there's spiritual wickedness in high places. Satan has a government up there all established of his own. Didn't he have a throne? Didn't he say, I'll, I, I'll exalt my throne? He's, he was the prince over the, the whole shooting match there, below the Lord, obviously. But notice, it goes on to say, all things were created by him and for him. He's the rightful heir. Verse 17, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Remember, the all things in the passage there are the things he's just talked about. The positions of rank and authority in the heaven and in the earth. Look at verse 18. Here's the, I've got, this, got the, the, the verse here lined for you. The people, a hidden people to reclaim the heavenly realm too. There's visible thrones in earth where he's going to be the Messiah of the nation of Israel. He's going to reign on the earth. And there's invisible thrones and dominions and so on in the heavens. Look at verse 18 there in your notes. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in what? All things. The heavens too. <laughs> he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. God's purpose was the Lord Jesus Christ created the heaven and the earth, and he created everything, all, everything in both realms. They were by him and for him and for his pleasure. And the Lord Jesus was to be the rightful heir and the king over it all. Satan usurped it. And God's word now is the record of God's purpose and what he's going to accomplish. Verse number 20 here. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. The things in the passage here are the positions of the rank and, and authority. Jesus Christ is going to reclaim both realms. Okay? But he's, he's, the head of the, he's the Messiah of Israel that he might have the preeminence in the earth. And he's the head of the body, the church, that in all things he can have the preeminence. And he's going to reclaim the heavens and the earth. He will reclaim his universe and reestablish it with redeemed mankind. Israel will inherit and rule the earth with him. And we, the body of Christ, will rule and reign in the heavens with him. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10 down there, he talks about the mystery of his will. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that... In the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things, where? In Christ. See, those are people. Both, which are where? Who are the all things that are in Christ? Who would that be in the heavens? That would be us. <laughs> and, which are on earth. Who, are the, who would be the things on earth in him? That would be the nation of Israel. See, his ultimate purpose is to gather the whole shooting match together underneath the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. A mystery of his will, some hidden wisdom, some hidden glory, a hidden program, now made known. Why, Paul? We got the answer, because God had some, some things to magnify about himself, his grace and his kindness and his love and his wisdom. You know, you can be the biggest guy on the block. You know, you can be the toughest guy in the joint. But uh, if, uh, you know, might just doesn't make right. If, if, you just, if you're just a bully, <laughs> you're, you're just going to push people around, aren't you? God is going to demonstrate not that he's just the most powerful, but he's the most wise. Because he took the wise in his own craft. He's worthy to be trusted. Amen? He's worthy um, to, um, to, to be trusted. What a privilege we have. We are participants in God's plan to reclaim his universe. Why, Paul? Because he had a new program to reveal. And when you get to the books of Romans to Philemon, which we're going to look at next week, there's things that are just different. They're nothing like the, the prophecy and the earth and, 
and uh, all those. Uh, the earth is wonderful. I'm not trying to diminish those things, but there's some wonderful things. And when you recognize the distinction and you keep the body of Christ its own entity and its own program and purpose, it brings such clarity to God's word. And uh, we will look at Paul's epistles next week. And uh, so we will look forward to that time together. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace and your love. We thank you for your worthiness. Father, as we look down through history, as we, as we see your plan and purpose, we see your faithfulness, we see your love and your kindness. But Lord, we see the exceeding riches of your grace and your kindness toward us who didn't have any covenants, didn't have any promises, were on the outside looking in. And yet you revealed a purpose that opened up the cross work to all of us simply by faith, resting in what our Savior did for us on the cross. Lord, we thank you for that, that great simplicity. And Father, once we, once we trust your Son, we're made a part of what you're doing. And Lord, may we walk worthy of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus as ambassadors for the King of heaven and earth. Lord, may we also walk with understanding understanding what you would have us make known and reveal today in the age of grace. And we thank you for that great privilege, and it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.